Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 38, SimD. Take it away, Patrick. We're going to start off here, episode 38, with a question from a viewer. Oh, well, we don't have viewers. Listener, a listener question. We have Although viewers. today we do have viewers. This is actually the first time we have viewers. Uh, last time we had viewer. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I don't know that it was one of our viewers who asked this question. It was definitely oh, a good listener, point. though. That's a good point. A, a listener. And they asked, uh, well, I should give credit to at least the first name of the person, but I don't have it. But it's okay. You'll oh, know I'll who you are. <laughs> uh, the question was, do computers ever make mistakes? And this is a good question. Uh, and uh, some people, I think this is actually posted in our uh, Google Plus uh, community. And so actually someone had written back and uh, we'll share our own opinions. But uh, one of the things when you you know first are introduced to computers is you're told like the computer doesn't ever make a mistake. It only does what you tell it to do. Uh, and sometimes as programmers, we uh, write bugs or faults. So, so quick interrupt. Yep. The, oh, the oh, asker right. was Matthew. Uh, I won't say his last name. Actually, his last name is right on G+. So it's Matthew Alabastro. Um, thank you for the awesome question. We love it. Yep, thank you. Uh, and so um, you're not always told computers don't make mistakes, but that, you know, the pro- it's always a programmer's fault or some software that was broken or wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the, the person who responded actually, you know, got the thing, the same thing that first came to my mind when I read the question, which is that there actually is sometimes the processors, the thing which are the, oh, simply the brain of the computer, but the thing that we think about when we think about a computer, you're typically thinking about the processor doing the work. And it does, does sometimes have logic flaws. Uh, things that it's supposed to do and there's several uh, famous ones but uh, one is that you know sometimes you have different lines that are supposed to correspond like if you do a divide by zero um, then that should be a certain kind of error but uh, sometimes that'll be actually triggerable by other stuff um, or won't get triggered at all and then this can cause a problem because it means your processor doesn't do the expected behavior Um, and there's we talked about one I think it was last episode or two episodes ago where it turns out the estimation for pi uh, in some of the Intel processors isn't as accurate by several, like, 10 bits or something uh, yep. as it could be. And it leads to kind of errors in uh, trigonometric functions near pi. Yeah, I mean, another one, I'm just, uh, there's a link to it. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. But there's this FDiv bug in, like, the 90s with Pentium where, like, they would... Uh, I don't remember this. I mean, I could read the article, but basically it's something to do with like the division, like calculating the remainder of the division or something. But, uh, but yeah, basically they got it wrong in the processor and, uh, you know, it just, it just means that like there are certain divisions that, you know, you can do them, but it won't give you the answer that, that you want it to. And, uh, you know, sometimes through some Christmas miracle, you can like, you can solve it in software by changing the firmware of the of the processor and things like that. But I mean, really, you know, many times it's just there's nothing that you can do about it. I mean, it's just it's etched. It's as if like, you know, you bought the wrong screwdriver or something, right? You're just kind of done. So but um, surprisingly, actually, sometimes oh, sometimes these bugs, you know, quote unquote bugs linger around. So like there's some quirk. Uh, that wasn't intended but then if you like a, you know if intel has like a quirk in their current line of processors amd is faced with this, the situation of trying to either replicate the bug or you know fixing it but then having you know compiler writers trying to determine which processor is being used if they want to work around it which is why it makes it difficult to fix right. it in software yep and i mean a lot of this i mean there's one thing i didn't realize until i moved to the west coast there's a ton of cross pollination so, you know, there's a ton of, like, Intel people who are at AMD and, you know, AMD people at Google and Google people at Facebook and Facebook, you know what I mean? And so, um, you know, obviously you can't just take the technology from one company and give it to the other. But it's like, if at the end of the day, there's like a core group of people and they agree on a way to do floating point, And then one of them leaves and goes to AMD and he implements almost the exact same way. And now you have the same bug on you know, 99% of the world's processors. Um, I actually thought of this like in a totally different way, which is 
the not the common way obviously because uh no one else seemed to think of it this way but also it's like it's very esoteric uh in hindsight but the first thing i thought when i saw this was in the context of like machine learning and things like that like do do computers ever make mistakes like in the sense that do they not do what you want them to do and uh i think that like uh this is actually like kind of interesting it's really it's it's like now we're we're things are getting kind of very high level with computers and i mean you're, you're doing a lot of like statistical analysis and a lot of these like stochastic processes and things like that and uh it's not really clear um like at some point the computer will start making mistakes like right now it's like if, if anything is wrong it's always our fault and in reality is like there's always you know you as a programmer can change things and the computer ultimately is supposed to be like reproducible right but uh like we're getting more and more into like crazy AI things, robotics, things like that. And so at some point, I mean, the computer will be kind of making mistakes. I mean, that's like, I don't know it's, if that crossover well, so, will ever happen. It's kind of So, weird. I mean, computers can make mistakes in certain ways, depending on how you think about it. Uh, besides just we say, like, um, if you get sometimes my credit card, I've had a couple times, it detect what it thought was fraud, right? Which is some computer, there's no person saying they're looking at my credit card history. But some computer mm -hmm. determines that my current spending habit looks a lot like someone who stole my credit card. And, and sometimes <laughs> they're right. One time they were You've right. You've been buying but, those like rugs, the Indian rugs or something. Okay. You know, that's like the number one thing. If someone steals your credit card, um, they will buy Indian rugs. In oh, fact, no. somebody, when they had the whole PlayStation fiasco, um, my credit card was one of the ones stolen. And sure enough, Capital One calls me up and says, did you buy, you know, four Indian rugs? That's like the first thing they that, asked me. That's really odd. Well, the one I, I think I've always heard I think before. they're very expensive. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Is that teenagers typically go buy shoes and then buy gas for them and all their friends. So if you fill up like, like me and my spouse's car, and then I went to the mall and bought something or whatever, and like that'll trigger it. Oh, wow. Um, but no, I, it, specifically what it triggered, triggered mine was I uh, made a change in like my, like I had moved. So I made a change in my address and then I ordered some computer parts online. And apparently that also looks exactly like someone stole your credit card, um, which makes oh, sense. Um, but, you know, some computer made a mistake, right? Like I didn't commit fraud. Um, yeah, right. But did it really make a mistake? No, it probably did execute the rules it was told to. But from my point of view, it was a mistake. I, there was no fraud. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing like if it if you if you, you know, I'm assuming they built this really complicated fraud system that like projected all of your credit card purchases to some like really high dimensional latent space. I mean, at some point it's like, I guess like making a mistake comes down to responsibility. Like, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, you're always responsible for the, for the computer, you know? But I mean, like, look at like these algorithmic trading computers where like they, uh, they do machine learning to like predict stock market prices and things like that. I mean, in that case, like you're saying, look, the computer's doing the trading you know, hopefully it wins more than it loses. But at the end of the day, it's like, I don't know if that's really, yeah, the responsibility thing is kind of fuzzy. So another mistake can be, uh, it has sort of gotten to your stochastic processes thing, but that if you are running your processor at, you know, uh, high temperature or close to, uh, you know, its power limits, you can, you know, have glitches, um, which yeah, cause right. problems. Or, you know, you always hear this classic thing, but it is actually true that there are, you know, cosmic events, you know, radiation, cosmic rays, which cause, uh, you know, logic levels to flip or invert temporarily and can inject noise at some level into the computer. And then the computer can think a zero is a one, right? And then all of a sudden that changes everything. Yeah, now right. your, you know, very large number is now a negative, large negative number because the first <laughs> bit got flipped, right? Like that can happen. Um, yeah, right. You know, statistically it's, you know, basically not going to happen but for someone it will happen yeah there's this interesting ted talk um it was from the security chief of twitter and basically she said like i don't remember exactly i'm going to kind of butcher this but she's saying something like you know if there's a one in a million chance that some crazy you know event would happen like your stalker happens to find you on twitter randomly like if that's a one in a million chance 
then it happens 50 times an hour in Twitter. You know what I mean? Like just, <laughs> and it's just kind of like- No, like, I guess that's what I was trying to say, yeah. So the chance yeah. of your computer having a cosmic event change it in a meaningful way is, you know, one in a billion. But the chance of a cosmic ray affecting someone's computer in a meaningful way is, you know, very high in a given day. Yeah, right, right. So, um, but yeah, so, yeah, okay. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Does it make cool. any relevant uh, difference today? Probably not, but it is an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so, for like, kind of, do you want to do news first, or do you want to cover this? Let's intro let's cover topic? this. Let's cover this. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I don't know how I got on this, but somehow, I. Uh, oh yeah, so, um, I feel very compelled to, like, I'm working with a lot of people who are just fresh out of college. And so, um, it's kind of cool. Like, a, it feels like you're looking at yourself, like, but younger, um, <laughs> or, or just like less experienced. Because like, I, they did all. They're doing all the same things I did, and it's like I, you know, can't obviously fault them for it. But it's like I think it's like in hindsight, it's it's clear like there's like lessons that neither one of us like. N like no one myself nor any of these other people have learned the easy way and we're all having to learn it the hard way um actually well hopefully i can make it so that they don't have to learn it the hard way but i wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about like rookie software engineer mistakes but and the, uh, wait, so the tldr of this inch of this intro is that you're getting old <laughs> i mean wise i mean wise wise womp, womp. you're getting wise <laughs> oh there is a core question it said uh what do old software engineers in Silicon Valley do? Or like what happens to old software engineers? And the number one answer was this guy. He said they become well-paid software engineers. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, um, but it okay. was kind of interesting. It made me think that like there really aren't that many old software engineers. Like you don't see a lot of like 50, 60 year old software engineers. And there's, like, there's probably a bunch of reasons for that. Wait, I, um, okay. Anyways, I digress. Yeah. But uh, so, so that's why we're thinking we're old, right? Anyways, so a couple of rookie software engineer mistakes. One of them, and this is a big one, is like making assumptions. And it's either because you want to you know, kind of save time or save processing or you don't want to change the schema or something like that. So like, uh, you know, I purposely didn't like no one on my team actually said any of these or anything like that. But uh, but this is like a you know, like a fictitious example is you know you have some document system and uh, you store the timestamp for all the documents and then all of a sudden you need to know whether you know a document was created by an admin or not and rather than having some boolean which says you know created by admin you say oh I know what I'll do you know if the timestamp is negative I'll just flip the sign of the timestamp um, if it's negative then it's an admin. Um, and so like things like that work, but the problem is you're kind of setting up a landmine for your future self. You know what I mean? Because you're, you're now like adding this cognitive overhead where you have to remember this sort of association that you only made up because it was kind of convenient, you know, given the circumstances. Um, and so you see just a ton of this kind of stuff where, you know, people will, uh, people will just kind of it's not really a shortcut because like often it's no, it's just overloading time. you're overloading yeah i do see this a lot yeah 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 optimization exactly. yeah you're overloading a field or a value to mean multiple things and it just makes it convoluted instead of breaking out to explicit fields yeah exactly i mean another case of this it's like a little bit of a different vein but it's where um someone starts off with like current measurement like double current measurement and then they need the previous measurement so they're like double previous measurement double current measurement and you're like okay but then they realize they need the last 10 measurements <laughs> and they're like previous previous measurement you know what i mean and it's just like it just grows organically and the next thing you know you like have this ridiculous thing that could just be an array right or the other pet peeve of mine is uh even in you know i guess this is more common maybe in dynamic type languages like python but uh and i even see people do this in c but like you'll have some you know uh, unsigned 8-bit uh, integer that is getting some value uh from a function 
then later they also use it to get a value from a different function, like later in that function, you know. But yeah, now yeah. these are two different things, but they just reuse the same variable. And it's oh, like, up yeah, here right. the variable meant this, now down here the variable means this. Like, why don't you just create a new, like the, the compiler will, you know, optimize this away. There's no reason for you to reuse the same variable name twice. Like yep. in a loop, like if you're looping and the loops aren't related, like fine, like I'm okay, like having the variable I, counter or whatever be used. But like, syntactically like they don't it's just like here's one value then here's a value from a completely unrelated function that also just happens to be of the same size and i no longer needed the other one so i'll just reuse the name it's like oh just create yeah. a new name yeah yeah that stuff is brutal um another one that i see a lot is uh people who don't put like asserts or exceptions or like to some extent tests in their code i mean everyone always complains about no tests but even just like asserts and exceptions, you know, I mean, it doesn't take much time to, as you're going through, say, okay, you know, I expect this list to have three things in it. So if it doesn't have three things, then blow up, you know, um, like code, a lot of the code I write, like, you know, a few days later will blow up or a week later will blow up. And usually it's because some other part of the system like violated one of the assumptions that I wrote, you know, and, uh, or even, you know, even if it blows up, like, if it blows up, like, a year later, that's even better, right? Because instead of just some really weird uh, runtime condition that maybe you don't even notice for a long time, it's, like, a year later, all of a sudden, it's, like, boom, uh, exception. Now, I expected the list to be three, and now it's four. And usually, you know, the exception will fire immediately after someone makes the, the change that causes the problem, right? So you don't have these, like, really weird latent... Um, issues that you have to like go back and play detective to figure out, you know? As you work in really, really large systems, this is where like continuous integration and unit tests become absolutely crucial. So yeah. you, you, even if you test your code, if you've changed something that other people were assuming about your code uh, and they don't also have tests or, uh, you know, there isn't some system kind of in doing integration testing, then it can go undiscovered for a while. Yep. Uh, yeah, totally. That, that's hard, right? So, Somebody in the chat said uh, they don't like it when uh, negative one is used to represent a failure state. That is another good yes. thing. Like, you see that where it's like the function, you know, returns an int, but yet, you know, they want, they really want to return an int and, you know, something else for the status. But instead of returning like a pair, they return an int and they're like, okay, this is going to be positive except it's negative one if this and it's negative two if like cows are flying and it's negative three if it's a if it's a monday and you're just like ah i can't deal yeah <laughs> well i similarly yes i did have this problem with a new person on on a team i had to help try to convince them which i don't know how successful i was but they had where it uh they would call some computation function it would return a result then you needed to call another function that said whether the value returned was currently valid or not. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, some state is being tracked and you need to call first and say, hey, is this other function going to be valid if I call it? Or if I've called it, is it currently valid? And I was like, oh. why don't you just return Boolean of whether it's valid? And then like, you know, in this case it was uh, C. So, you know, and then pass a pointer in and then you'll know like if it's valid, the value in the pointer is now, you know, the pointer, the yeah, destination right. is now set to it. And they're like, I don't know. Like, why can't you just call this other function? And I'm like, well, because <laughs> then if someone doesn't call that function, then like, they have no idea if like, you're just going to give them garbage. Yeah. I mean, this way you're forcing them to, uh, to, 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 and they're yeah, like, well, they could that. ignore the, the fact that you're returning a Boolean. I'm like, yeah, but at least it's like, <laughs> more obvious to someone reviewing the code that, hey, why is this returning a Boolean and why are you ignoring it? Yeah, right, right. So. I mean, in some languages, you can't ignore return values, like not without the compiler getting mad at you and stuff. Which is a good thing. Yeah, that's right. So, okay. Cool, man. Uh, do you do exceptions in C? No. I don't think, yeah. So, uh, can't do anything there. <laughs> but I do have assertions. Oh, okay, that's good. And typically the way I've always, I, I see it is that you have assertions disabled when you're in release, but in debug you have them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so that, that, that always leads to this debate. Should you have non-disableable assertions? So then you end up with 
debug only assertions and then regular assertions and what is semantics around it but it gets really yeah then it depends sort of on you know do you want is your goal that the system survives anything yeah, or is so, your goal that so like is it you fail loudly? like can you even theoretically recover from this yeah right so yeah well um the last one reinventing the wheel um you know we uh there's like a ton of good you know source code out there a lot of it is very liberally licensed um you don't need to uh go and like create your own hash table and things like that there's a lot of it for you um so yeah i think this is a big one actually and i, I think that like actually you know connecting up libraries is really hard i mean especially in a lower level language like c you know wiring together libraries you know, they might have different structs and you have to maybe do some fancy casting or you have to, you know, translate back and forth. And, you know, doing that stuff efficiently is, is really hard. Like, it's cerebral. And, you know, coding something from scratch uh, is much more, like, mechanical in a sense. It's, like, easier. But, uh, but you know, you're, you're, when you code from scratch, you're going to introduce all these errors you know, that you're going to have to debug. Like, you're not going to write perfect code. And you're not going to write code that's as well-tested as you know, an, an open source library that's ubiquitous, right? So, uh, um, yeah, so this is just another one that I kind of tend to see a lot of. So, people depending just on your company, to, uh, using open source libraries may or may not get you into endless waiting with the lawyers. Uh, yeah, so it depends on the license. Like, I yeah, think some are licenses you a lawyer? are. Am I a lawyer? No. Yeah. Okay. Then if you work at any large company, regardless of that, you know, this, this license is safe to use. They'll first want it to be reviewed by a lawyer. Yeah, that's true. There are and lawyer that, that casts. Just, that, yeah. That's yeah, I guess problem. it, it depends on like, uh, like usually the lawyer cats are pretty, pretty responsive. We had an issue where, uh, they didn't approve Emacs 24, but people were just using it. Nobody really thought anything of it. And finally, somebody was like, oh, we should probably ask the lawyer cats. And they sent an email, and it was approved, like, within a couple hours. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying all lawyers are bad. I just mean typically, depending on your, you know, company, they may or may... you, As programmers, we sometimes say, oh, I know this license is, you know, friendly or, you know, fine to use. Or this is in the public domain. I'll just go ahead and use it. But, you know, there's also someone needs to be tracking everything you're using because typically you're also supposed to at least give credit or cite. Oh you, yeah, you're yeah, using something, true. right? So you have to make sure you have procedures in place so that you are keeping track of everything you're using. Yeah, that so. definitely. Actually, that's interesting. Be, I wonder if there's like a Git hook for that, you know, where it somehow like Git can become aware of your what open source libraries you're using. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know, know where <laughs> I'm going with that. <laughs> Time for the news. News. So I'm you go the, first. Okay, so I got the first article. And uh, I'm not super uh, good with Markov chains, so I don't know how good this description of Markov chains in this article is, but I thought it was okay. a really interesting... Uh, this isn't how I traditionally see Markov chains, but it was an interesting approach that... Uh, uh, the link will be in the show notes. But um, this person had read a Reddit posting of a challenge, of a programming challenge, how do you simulate this... Uh, collection of particles undergoing radioactive decay where you get here's the starting number of particles in various states and here's the probability that a particle decays from one state to another state the second state to a third state so on and so forth and so they were talking about that you know if you have a million particles one way to do it is you know essentially pick a random number for each uh, of the particles uh, and then determine uh, based on the the probability specified if it if that particular particle you know transition state or not uh, and how that this, you know, obviously is, is, is very costly and slow. And mm -hmm. then instead how that, you know, uh, what they were saying is using Markov chains, but what amounts to creating a probability matrices and what they were calling a transfer uh, function that you can essentially multiple, do a matrix multiplication and essentially do the same thing almost exactly. Um, so you're not simulating each particle, but you're simulating kind of all of them simultaneously uh, you know, undergoing this, and then what populations will you end up with at the end? Um, it was a good. Sense. It was a good article. So for really so like large, you're solving numbers, you're solving like the recurrence, right? That's right. Like yeah, what, the recurrence you're solving solution. like several steps in one. Yeah. 
Cool. And, and so it wouldn't, I, I, it didn't ex- exactly, I'm, I know I'm trying to remember, but I, you know, I don't think this would work for a really small number. Like if you had, you know, three particles, right? Like it's random, so maybe it'll work, but you're going to have some weird stuff going on. But when you get into large numbers, right? Like it, it really all does, it all just becomes statistical. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was one of those things that like kind of blew my mind. I mean, a while back, it's like this idea where uh, that that sort of I'm trying to see if I can grok this. So it's like, oh yeah, it's like you know if you're if you have a fifty percent chance of something happening, and and uh, everyone in America has that chance, then that means half the people in America have it and half don't. So this idea of going from like chance to you know sample like populations, uh-huh. it's sort of like yeah, like, like if you if if ten uh, percent of the people have a tattoo, there's like thirty million people with tattoos or something like that. Like that whole going from like percentages to like it's like oh yeah, you know like at some point when the sample size is large enough, percentages become fractions. Yeah, like, is your conf- like, it, it's not exact. Yeah. I'm not a statistician, but it's like your confidence interval, right? So, like, if 10% have tattoos and you have five people, like, how many people have tattoos? It's like, yeah, well, it's, if all five did, that doesn't really prove anything. Like, yeah, it doesn't say yeah. for certain that your 10% was wrong. It just, like, could be that you got really a, a very rare, a low probability event happened. Right. Um, but, you know, if you're, like you said, 100 million people and you say 10% have tattoos, you're going to be plus or minus a few, like, you know, in the 99% confidence interval, your standard, like the amount of variance you expect to see is really low. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is taking that same, same approach. But it was an interesting thing to remind us that when you start to deal with very large numbers of something that you maybe need to step away from actually literally simulating it. Yeah, actually this, uh, I was given an interview question, which is exactly this problem. Oh, really? Yeah, the interview question was, I'm, I'm totally going to butcher this, but it was something to the effect of, it was something about, like, disk seeking. So, uh, you know, it's like, you want to write data in a way where when you read the data, you could read it, um, you know, just consecutively. Um, and so, so it's like, but you don't know for sure how you're going to read the data. Um, But anyway, it boiled down to, um, like, treating the problem of, like, going from one item of data you're reading to the next, treating it as a Markov chain. Oh. And it it ended up being exactly this. So, uh, so yeah. So, read this article. You could (laughs) could answer an interview question. (laughs) Uh, So, mine is, uh, my news article is Axis, Destroy Your Friends with Math Functions. Um... It looks pretty cool. Um, I saw the video. I, I tried to play it, but they don't have a single player. So um, uh, I haven't actually played it yet. But I think the idea is, you know, there's some islands that are, you can think of them as like walls that you can't hit. And then there's a tank or some enemy. And you have to draw some function that carves its way around these walls and hits the person and it's like that game uh scorched earth oh yeah 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 Yeah, where like you had the angle and the velocity of a you know basically you defined a ray and based on that ray you shot a projectile that you know arced with gravity and had to hit, hit somebody so it's that kind of idea but they really took it to the next level um you know you come up with some crazy sine wave that like dodges a wall and hits somebody so oh. um i thought it was pretty cool like a very uh, check it out <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you want to destroy us, uh, uh, feel free to invite us. I don't actually know. I think the way the multiplayer works is you have to send someone a link or something. So, right. um, but well, yeah, try they, they it out. It in the uh, chat room. Yeah, let us know uh, what you think. Next article is why Python is slow, uh, and uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into all of the reasons enumerated in this article. But it's a very fascinating under the hood look at. Uh, the mechanics of Python. So, you you know, we talk about, oh, Python is, you know, dynamically typed and interpreted, but, you know, like, what, like, what is the actual thing going on under the hood that causes it to be that much slower than, you know, C++ or whatever? And uh, this guy did a really good job of breaking it down kind of piece by piece. And it gives a lot of insight, you know, that you would never think about kind of ordinarily. You might at a high level say, oh, Python 
you know, uses an object to represent an integer, but how exactly? Um, and this article mm -hmm. goes into that. So check it out. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so this next one is uh, <laughs> the day I lost a ton of money. <laughs> and it's a... You're uh, censoring yourself. I'm censoring. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a ton of money. Um, an S ton of money. And, uh, and that's not like an S expression, different kind of S. Oh. But basically, uh, uh, it's from this guy who's like a day trader. And it just kind of blew my mind. Um, like, just like how this whole thing works and, and how these people like, you know, try like analyze the market or don't in this case and, and just lose a ton of other people's money. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of sad. But uh, the whole thing is kind of interesting. Um, it's, it has some funny pictures and stuff like that. So, uh, I haven't read this um, yet, but it was, it, it is interesting. I, 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 I was just skimming. I was like, Whoa, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. So basically this guy, you know, it's all about his, it's like your stereotypical, you know, rise to power and then, and then, you know, eminent destruction. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So. So time for on to book, of, book the show. of the show, show, show. My book of the show is Emacs quick reference card, <laughs> but it's not only Emacs. Um, in general, reference cards are pretty awesome. I have had the Emacs reference card um, uh, like taped to my computer monitor um, for, I don't know, way too long. But oh, I have uh, one of these for GDB. Oh, do you really? Yes. Are there really that many commands in GDB? Uh, yes. Oh, see, have see, you I'm used total, GDB before? I, the only thing I've done with GDB is halt the program when there's a C++ exception. So I know like two commands in GDB. Oh, there are, yes, many, many commands in GDB. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, in general, there's a reference card for almost everything. Like if, if you're doing Java, there's a Java reference card. Um, and uh, I'm curious what a Java reference card has on it. Yeah, um, this is a good question. So the, uh, you know, some of these things which are more like kind of muscle memory type things, it's really good to have a reference card. Um, sometimes like you're right there on the spot and you're like, oh, I want to, you know, move this line up two lines. But like, I don't want to like cut it and paste it or, you know, like if you're feeling kind of adventurous, you can just look at the quick reference card and uh, it might have something uh, you can like slowly add it to your repository. So for things like Emacs, Vim, you know, Eclipse, things which have keyboard shortcuts. Um, also, if like if you're learning a brand new language, um, rather than just like hitting Google every time, it's like how do I do a for loop? How do I add? You know, it's like have a quick reference card, and it will help you through. Like I had this when I was learning um, Swift. I just someone had already made a Swift quick reference card, or maybe even Apple had made it. I don't know. I have to double check, but I. I had this quick reference card and it reminded me of, you know, the obvious things until I got familiar. Yeah. So what's the I Java just, quick reference card say? Well, first of all, it's like crazy pages. like description of the collections. Like oh, God. A list is a part of a collection. An abstract set is you've related to a set, which is part of a collection. Like it has this like giant map on one part and has like all the keywords. So a lot of it is kind of, I don't know, maybe I consider too low level. Like here's the built-in types. Here's declaration modifiers. Um, yeah, I think. But I'm, like are the you description the one is too from low. Like here's a declaration modifier, which I didn't know existed in Java. Strict FP, and it says strictly apply IEEE 754 to a class or method. But I don't know. Like I can vaguely guess at what that means because I understand the words that are written here. But I don't like. I'd have to go look this up anyways. Are you looking at the one from NYU.edu? No. Oh, I just typed in Java quick reference card. I typed in just Java reference card. I'm looking at one from oh. ac.uk, University of Glasgow. Glasgow. Oh, okay. Ooh, I'm on the same one now. Oh, this is, uh, this is intense. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I'm the not sure that's from, useful. The one from NYU, if you search for quick reference card, Java quick reference card, that one actually looks pretty good. It's oh, okay. the second link because the first one's an Android app. <laughs> um, okay. Anyways. But... Uh, but yeah, I, I, again, like, like this is really, I mean, this is for two things, either muscle memory kind of things like, like Emacs, you know, your editor, where there's like a huge, deep learning curve and you just don't want to bite it all at once because it, a lot of it is situational, right? 
it's good for those things and it's good for you know java i'm a java programmer it's day one and uh you know i don't know how to do anything yet mm. um so you know if you're picking up a new language uh you know duct tape the quick reference card don't, to uh don't, don't your head tape. oh <laughs> your, okay we're just moving yeah, on duct tape Duct tape it to your uh, to your monitor, yeah. and uh, it helps a lot. My book of the show, again, not being useful but being entertaining, is uh, the Moat in God's Eye. This is a book okay. co-written by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell. Uh, it was written in 1974, so I really am digging these like 1970s and 80s uh, books because this one actually doesn't show its age as much as some of the other ones I've read, but. I didn't realize it was written in 1974 when I uh, was starting to, to read it. I was actually listening to this one on audio. Um, but, okay. but when I was starting to, to read it, I didn't actually realize it was written that long ago. And there were some weird mentions of like personal computers and like like having audible, like, connect, like almost like an audible modem was being described. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. And later I looked at but but I managed to read the whole story and not realize that it was written in 1974. And I looked it up, and ah. I'm like, oh, now that I know it's written in 1974, I understand these weird, like, the computers they did have were very limited, uh, and they had weird nuances to them. Uh, yeah, right. And so uh, now I've ruined it if you decide to read it. But it's it like, is, it is still a really good book. In the future, we'll have microwaves. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, well, so it's like, you know, oh, the magnetic memory storage was one megabyte in size. <laughs> it's like, what? Uh, huh? uh, that's so good. No, it, that's not exactly, but you know, something sort of like that. Basically. Yeah, right. No, it's hilarious. And, and but um, but they managed to do a really good job actually of avoiding specific technologies, which has got to be hard to do. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and so, but anyways, it's a it's a story about. I, I don't like saying too much because I don't I don't want to ruin anything, but it's a space sci fi adventure. So cool man check it yeah, out I, cool. I really enjoyed it and apparently i just found out when i was uh, getting the link for the show notes that uh there's now a, there's actually a sequel that was written in like the 90s so now i like want to read the sequel oh is it by the same person well it's two That'd people be larry niven and jerry purnell they, they're both know, science they... fiction authors and they got together to write this book and the sequel wow so they got together 20 years later to write the sequel so these people are like like very prolific writers so if you've ever heard of ring world uh i think that was also, hang on, I'm gonna, which one? It, but that's Larry Niven as well in the 70s wrote this Ring World book. Oh, okay. Um, and I saw, I actually went to a talk that he did. Um, and he's continuing to write books in the Ring World series even as early, like as recently as a year or two ago. Oh, wow. So that's kind of crazy. Uh, Jerry Purnell also writes, um, to, uh, still to now, I think. Have you ever written a short story or a book or anything? When I was I mean, in high fiction. school for school assignments. Yeah, same here. Okay. I haven't. Uh, I haven't ever written anything. I have a friend who is a English major, and she writes like short stories. And they actually have kind of like we have hackathons. They have like hackathons, basically, where it's like write a book in a month, and uh, she just like writes, you know, eight hours a day or something ridiculous. All right, time for tool of the show. Tool of the show. My tool of the show is Open EMU, which is pretty freaking awesome. Um, it's Mac only, which is a shame, uh, but it has a an unbelievable UI. So Open EMU is a what's called an emulator front end, and so what that means is, you know, they take a lot of emulators. Most emulators have like a command line interface right so you can just like execute the emulator you know they might have a little gui if you if you run the emulator as like a little program it'll pop up a little gui usually something just really crappy where you open a file like zsnes right had that like really ghetto looking gui but if you were to like run zsnes with a uh, um you know arguments you can actually like launch zsnes and go straight to a game right so people have created front ends where the whole point is to like give you a better user interface um, and give you like a you know a window into your library of of um, you know cartridges that you legally own. So um, so this Open EMU is pretty epic. So you can see from the screenshot if you're watching the Twitch stream, um, like 
this it kind of looks like iTunes. Um, it has this like it actually downloads the cover art for you. So there must be some must be some open source or some repository where where they can get these all these covers because so they have covers for almost everything. And uh, downloads the cover art. It like analyzes the the you know the hash of the of the ROM to figure out like what game it is. And then it like corrects the file name, the title, all that stuff. So like it's like iTunes, it, like legit, like you know, figures out the artist. You know, in this case, the developer. I can't believe you just used legit and emulation in, in the sentence together. <laughs> uh, so this is this is pretty epic, um, pretty pretty exciting. They even have a cool website. No. Um. And no. What? They their website has my new my newest pet peeve is the equivalent of the blink tag. Where you scroll down and stuff animates as you're scrolling, like you don't like that? Oh, I hate that. Really? Oh, so oh, much. I think, it's, I think it's so good. No. Uh, Why? I think it looks awesome. No, it's awful. I think it's like uh, it's, it's awful. Like a you movie. should feel bad if you write. It's like a like movie that. that you can watch no. over and over again. No. The, I'm watching after it. the Apple announcement I'm watching for it. like the is it the new iPad or the new iPhone? They did a website like this, and it's just awful. So confusing. <laughs> I very well, it's much confusing. It. There's one direction. Well, you so this one down. actually doesn't scroll back until you scroll off screen. That's even weirder. That is weird. I like it when it's like I can I can sort can of relive the it? moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we had a, a website or news article like last time, and after I talked about, it, I tried to like actually like read the whole thing, and I had to give up because it was like doing this. I think it was Coin. Coin did this really badly, actually. Okay. Um, well, it's my new pet peeve. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I love your pet peeve. But anyways, <laughs> so <laughs> wait, no, you hate my so, pet peeve. No. Um. No, I love your pet peeve. I, the thing peeve I that hate you have you a love. pet peeve that's not my pet peeve. Okay. Anyways, um, it's pretty cool. Another thing that these guys get right, which is genius, is like one of these obvious, like can't believe I didn't think of that kind of things, is they basically they bought one of you know, the most common joysticks. Like if you just go on Logitech and try and buy a PC joystick and also like the Xbox controller and like they just bought all of these and then for each one they configured it how it should be. And then if you plug in like a Logitech or Xbox controller, you don't have to like set all of the little keys. Like say, oh, this is the up arrow on my controller because they've done it for a oh, lot of the nice. popular controllers. That's like, yeah, it's like clever little add-on. Um, it's pretty cool. Check it out if you're into that. So that's my t -t -t tool of the show. Mine is mint.com. I think we've probably, I'm sure we've talked about it before, but I don't care because I was just <laughs> thinking the other day how, how awesome it is. Okay. So if you're not using My mint.com is completely broken. It's still, it, it uh, I just haven't been keeping up to date. I need to like reconnect it to my accounts and everything. So yeah, I, I think this is one of those things where it actually used to work better than it does now. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> sort of, because I think as far as I can tell, what happens is the credit card companies have their own solutions, right? And their own things they want to go. And so they're not super uh, keen on the idea of like, making sure to stay compatible with mint.com every change oh uh, and so even though like you know as a customer i want them to stay compatible you know they want to force me into using like you know oh american express use the american my your american express app on your phone it's like well i want to use mint because i could just have one and yeah they, right anyways so i do occasionally oh, there's periods where stuff stops working and then it, they eventually fix it uh, oh, okay so i just bear through the the pain but when it works, it works really beautiful, which is like, I, I don't have to go to like my bank and my credit card uh, and other stuff to like see, st I just go to Mint and it tells me like, here's where you're at. And they, they get the graphics, right? Where I can like go and say, how I've been doing over the last year. Like what, like what is my trajectory been? Have I been spending more than I make, making more than I spend? Like what are the months where I spend the most? Like why? Uh, all that kind of analysis, which for me, like I don't, stick to a you know like allocate fully allocated budget where it's like you know you have ten dollars to spend on you know coffee houses yeah that never makes sense it's usually well, some i think what do, you're doing you know but i don't but yeah. what i do like is keeping tabs on where i'm spending money and like right thinking about yep. it like hey you know that's a lot of money i should cut back on that because yeah it's amdahl's law right you get the biggest return for minimizing the biggest expense right yeah that and also just like the fact that 
when you look at it in one place, you say, oh, that's kind of a lot. Like I can, I should cut that back. And then I, I have been successful in doing it that, and I don't, the hassle of a, a budget never made me stick to it. Yeah. That's ex- I'm exactly in the same boat, right? Like, uh, <clears throat> like there's a few things like, you know, and think about it, right? Like cable and phone right away. That's like, you know, it could be up to $200 for some people, right? A month. Yep. That is absolutely gigantic. I mean, that dwarfs your gas bill. Well, maybe depending on your how much you drive. Bill. Well, that definitely dwarfs your coffee bill. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that there's like a handful of things that people spend just an incredible amount of money on and uh, reducing even just a little bit there can make a huge difference. Like I was finally able to get my family off text messaging. And uh, I mean, that's significant. I mean, it saved us like $20 a month. You know, I mean, wow. it's like, you know, it's probably more than we spend in gas because I take the bus, I take the uh, shuttle to work. So, uh, yeah, we probably saved almost our entire gas bill just in getting rid of SMS. Nice. Yeah, and, and I li- so I like it for you looking at stuff. And like I said, the trends to like, wow, I spend how much and on clothes or whatever. Like, oh, that's kind of crazy. And like, Patrick, oh, your clothes spending is out of control. It's like, I we know, have, like, which is kind of obvious, I guess, this. but like November and December, we end up buying, you know, Christmas gifts or whatever for family. And so then like spending in November and December are typically high. Right. And right. so like, okay, like I know like to be careful the next couple of months and like stuff not related to Christmas spending that I can wait because I know Christmas spending is going to be high. Yeah. Don't buy that shirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, Mint. You actually is is clothes a large expense for you? No, no. I was just trying to say something <laughs> generic and not very personal. I'm just giving you a hard time. That's my pet peeve. Is uh, is when I'm not giving Patrick. Are you a saying hard I don't time. look stylish and handsome enough to uh, be spending I, a lot on my clothes? I think you look so handsome that I demanded you show your face in the podcast in in the stream. Sim D. Sim D. All right, so, so right off the top. Well, yeah, so Sim D, right off the bat, we'll, we'll spoil it for everyone. Uh, single instruction, multiple data. Mind and so blown. what that means is, you know, <clears throat> uh, like a canonical example is, you know, I have three lists. I have two lists with a bunch of numbers in them, and then I have a third list that I want to hold the sum of the numbers of the first two lists. But I want to be like an element-wise sum. So I take the first element of the two lists, add them up. Take the second element of the two lists, add them up. And it's like the same exact instruction, right? So you could, you know, like you could as a, like if you, you could just have the assembly code or what have you say, you know, put the first item in a register, you know, put the first item from both lists in two registers, add them up, put that in the third list. Do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, right? But if you're doing something like so obvious, like the same exact operation, but you're just doing it on different spots of the of the memory, then you can do what's called single instruction multiple data, where you say something like, take these 10 things and add them together. Um, but because you're doing exactly the same thing to all 10, you don't have to repeat yourself. You just say, do it to all 10. And... Uh, it just kind of magically works. So so the way this, what this buys you is parallelism, as Jason described. So things go faster, and that's always a good thing. Uh, people like faster. Um, and mm-hmm. the, the way it works is in the processor, you can think about, so, so like as Jason was saying, you're you know, adding these element-wise, all these things in a list. So if you have each element in a list is 8 bits wide, and you have a 64-bit ALU, arithmetic logic unit so you have the ability to add 64-bit numbers you could add two 64-bit numbers or you could add eight eight 8-bit numbers and the only difference is you need to prevent the carry between each 8-bit number Uh, so typically there's a carry bit where you know if two numbers are one it has in binary it has to carry to the next uh, digit and so you need to be able to turn that off on the boundaries so you have eight gotcha. with carries, then you have a boundary between eight bits that has the ability to either carry or not, depending on if it's a normal 64-bit add or a SIMD 64-bit add. And when you're doing a SIMD 64-bit add, uh, on each of the eight boundaries, or seven boundaries, each of the seven boundaries, um, you disable the carry bits. 
And so what gotcha. happens is then when you add two 64-bit numbers, you're actually adding eight 8-bit eight numbers and storing the result with no carries between them. Um, and so uh, that allows okay. you to do, instead of saying, normally you would have to move an 8-bit number into the 64-bit register, move another 8-bit number into the 64-bit register, add the two, store them in a 64-bit register, and then write that out to memory. But all the rest of that 50, well, oh, 50... Uh, uh, 56. But it's so late at night, 56. Oh man, it's too late <laughs> at night. 56 bits are all just going to be zero. So you're adding zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, you know, 56 times. And that's just a yeah, waste. Yeah, right. right. So that's how SIMD buys you an advantage. And I and always thought that, I mean, and so correct me if I'm wrong, like, but, and, and I'm probably wrong, but w- w- what is, I always thought that it was a separate processor than the ALU. So some, like I thought it was like a co- Sometimes not. It, it, it's, these are all, oh. this is like at a fundamental architectural, like they share these similarities. But sometimes gotcha. just like floating point unit can be a separate thing or inline, like it just is a deci- architectural decision. Gotcha. Um, okay, that makes sense. And so what it turns out is normally the instruction set will support like 64-bit integers, but they'll have 128-bit special, two special 128-bit registers and corresponding ALU with this option. But they'll have the ability to do it on 32-bit boundaries, 64-bit boundaries, you know, various divisions uh, because you may not always you want to do as many as possible but typically like the 8-bit boundary example I gave wouldn't be very useful people don't want to only add 8 bits at a time so you typically you'd have like a 32-bit boundary a 64-bit boundary 128-bit boundary for 256-bit wide SIMD would be very common gotcha Um, so if it's 256-bit wide SIMD then you can do uh what eight? eight you can add eight numbers in one instruction okay got it yep. but so typically it's, I, I think most of it so we'll get to this in a minute a lot of this is used for graphics and so you're typically dealing with 32-bit numbers and you want to do we'll get to why later four 32-bit numbers and so it's very common to have 128-bit oh, okay um, but like i said these are all just like it, it, it's a concept right so i'm sure every variation has been done at some point uh, yeah, and, right. and that's kind of architecturally how it works. And, and like I said, the ALU is for addition, but it would also be the same supported operations for division, multiplication, reciprocals, bit masking. You know, all those kinds of things would typically be supported in a similar fashion. Um, gotcha. We've previously talked a little bit about GPU programming. Uh, I think we did an episode on CUDA. And um, mm-hmm. a difference between this and the way GPUs work is that in SIMD, if you have a, a branching logic statement, if statements, you, even though the GPU doesn't handle that great, it has support for handling it because each thing is running on its own minimally functional processor, but it is its own processor. So they can be doing slightly different things. You just lose some efficiency. But with SIMD instructions, right. you actually cannot. So you, like we said, you're treating, it's, it becomes a 128-bit number, a 256-bit number, and it just has these weird boundaries within it. But you're responsible for shuffling the data into that number and back out. Uh, and so you can't make decisions like if the second item is this and at the same time if the third item is this, like you would have to do those sequentially. Gotcha. That um, makes and, sense. and so that's a that's a big difference. Um, but the other difference is it's cheaper from a silicon perspective to implement this, right? So um, as opposed to a whole swarm of G, spe- specialized GPU processors. Um some of the common ones. What about have, like performance? Like, is it the same? I mean, is it different. worse than a GPU? Or? Different. Oh, it's different. Depends okay. on what you want to do, right? Like, it. They're all different. So the GPU has uh, advantages, but they're it's it's more costly, right? So you're not going to typically. It, it's done in a different way. So like in a, gotcha. a low a low power small processor, there's no way you'll ever have like a whole bunch of GPU cores. Um. Gotcha. Because they were talking at one time about like Intel wanted to put a GPU on the on die. Um, motherboard. Yeah, yeah. No, or, oh, die. yeah, yeah. Okay. On the actual on core. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on, on die, but you still have to typically you would still want different memory because the access patterns are different. So you'd want to move back and forth between. It. Anyways, it gets complicated. Oh, I see. They're just okay. two different tools. Gotcha. Uh, okay. <clears throat> And so the things you may have heard of before, which are uh, implementations of SIMD, specifically Pentium, if you remember way back, you would have heard of MMX processors. I think this is multimedia extensions. 
And so okay. you'll often hear of these as like some sort of extension because what it's saying is you have the normal instruction set, then there's some supported extension to that instruction set, which allows for this you know extra wide operations to take place. Um, also SSE, um, so SSE was simultaneous SIMD execution or extension, one of those, okay. something like that. So those are Pentium one. So SSE, SSE two. So I think it's like Pentium yeah, three, Pentium four. Right? Yeah. So um, you'll have heard of those before. And then for ARM processor getting powerful now, or, or getting common now, and uh, ARM processors also have their version of SIMD, which is called Neon. Um, and you'll hear these a lot with multimedia. And the reason why is because, like I was saying, <clears throat> so graphics processing, video codecs, audio, this kind of thing, because these have a lot of, uh, I don't know the exact right word, blind operations, where you just want to blindly apply the same mathematical function to a lot of data all at the same time. Okay. And so... Um, these work these extensions are really good at speeding those things up and you can get you know like we were saying so if you can do four or eight 32 bit instructions at one time that's like a 4x or 8x speed up for that portion of the code um gotcha. so some examples that we want to do we talked about like you could add two numbers in a list you could do cross products you could do dot products you could do averaging so averaging would be a little bit where you start to get into some trickiness right so for averaging if you have let's say four 32-bit numbers you can do at a time, and you have uh, 16 items in your list, you'd want to add two sets of four twice. So you'd have four and four, oh, four and four, like and you'd do them like simultaneously, a, and then you'd have yeah. two sets of four resultant. Then you'd add those two sets. So now you've done three operations. This is really hard to describe over only it becomes like a pyramid. It's like a pyramid. It's a pyramid, exactly right. So you'd have, now you have done three operations, then you will no longer be able to use SIMD really uh, because you need to add that one last remaining set of four together uh, and then divide by the total number of elements. Um, but you can see how you, depending on how many operations you have, you can get a very large speed up. Yeah, right. So uh, just a shout out to Pano DK who just subscribed to or followed the stream. So thanks. Nice. Oh, he also we had have, a suggestion we have our first about Earlier, we have our right first in. follower, which Yay. is pretty awesome. Um, so another one you'll hear a lot is a four by four matrix multiply. Uh, and so in graphics, this is because you have uh, typically uh, three dimensional uh, rotation matrices and uh, coordinates that are stored for triangles and, and various. And you, you store the fourth one to account for some mathematical quirk. I don't know if we've ever talked about that before. Yeah, like the quaternions, right? Yeah. Um, so you typically yeah, yeah. do a four think, by four matrix I feel like we multiply. talked about it briefly, but like... Uh, yeah, we didn't go into a lot of detail, but let's just say that uh, there's some funky math you can do using 4D math, which has no relationship to what you're actually doing, but just mathematically like gives you some niceties. Is that is like a one-liner that can yep. kind of wrap yep. it up? And so I appreciate this. So this is four by four matrix multiply with pretty much all these kind of SIMD instructions that works really well um, and gives you ah, a big speed up because gotcha. you're doing that over and over and over again because you're doing coordinate transform after coordinate transform after coordinate transform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to put this in perspective, right? Like <coughs> if you're doing, let's say you're making a video game, right? <clears throat> and uh, um, you have some dude, you know, like Grand Theft Auto style and he's running and he's holding like two Uzis, like John Woo, like dual wielding <laughs> Uzis, right? So now it's like, you want to render, you know, a bullet coming out of the Uzi. So you need to do a transformation to go from the universe to the camera, a transformation to go from the camera to the person you're looking at. That's another, you know, matrix multiply. And then a transformation to go from that person's frame of reference to his hand, one to go from the hand to the barrel of the gun, and another one to account from the barrel of the gun out to the bullet. Yeah, right? and so even like, like if the bullet's rotating, those, you know, like the spin of the bullet. Yeah, they have to do another one for that, for the spin of the bullet. Right, so, so you have to do like 10 of these 4x4 four four matrix multiplies just to like know where the bullet is. Like you haven't even drawn the bullet. If you want to draw all the little triangles of the bullet, now you have to do one of those for each of those triangles, right? So you're doing a lot of them. <laughs> So yeah, so any speed up, you can, and this is why, like I was saying before, these typically have names like associated with multimedia or graphics, uh, is because that's where you'll see a lot of the use. Same thing like right. audio processing, you know, you'll want to apply some filter, and typically at every point in the signal, you want to look at the surrounding few points. 
So now what you basically end up with is like you shift an element in, you apply the same operations. You shift the next element in, you apply the same operations. And you just keep doing that over and over again. And this is where you can really get the kind of naive, big speed ups because it's really, really well suited. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, but this takes a lot of like, you know, hand power. And I, so I've written in several of these SIMD languages. They're not called languages. SIMD styles. And it almost extensions amounts... Extensions or extensions, something? Extensions, sure. Yeah, and, and what it amounts to is you're writing assembly code. Like, you're not, but you are. Because you basically need to worry about everything. Like, I need to load up the special registers with data exactly arranged how I need it. Then I need to do specifically like these low level operations. Then I need to get the data back out. These are the kinds of things you typically worry about when you're doing like assembly programming. And this is mm -hmm. very, very similar, I find it. And so you typically okay. kind of wrap it in a function, you stick that function somewhere and you call in with uh, very nice data classes or objects, I uh, pass them in. Then you do this very kind of horrendous, uh, but fast, uh, you know, assembly level kind of programming, and then you kind of mm -hmm. pass it back out in a nice class. Um, oh, gotcha. That's the way I've kind Is, of What happens it if you get it wrong? Like, I mean, it probably it doesn't up. throw an exception, right? <laughs> I mean, like, do you end up with weird numbers or <laughs> yeah, does it like just, literally? Well, it depends on what you mean by mess it up. I, well, let's say like you uh, have some kind of out of bounds or something like that. Like, do you get weird numbers or does the it's whole typically like wraps crash? or overflows or underflows or? Oh, I see. Yeah, it depends. But, but yes, this gotcha. is the general flow of it. Um, and so obviously that's painful, but the good news is uh, if you're writing a graphics library and you optimize some part of that, right, people are calling into your API, not to your, they're not going to try to write these SIMD instructions themselves. Yeah, that's true. I mean, for most people out there, you know, you're just relying on, you know, if you're using Unity or whatever for the game engine, you're relying on them to do the this this stuff for you, so... Um, but actually, you can write code which um, which does SIMD and not even know it. What? And that's with uh, I know that's automatic vectorization. Which I actually you know remember when this came out. Like I remember when GCC four point seven came out, and uh, I was like, I just I just remember just my mind being blown because I don't really stay up to date on compilers, um, like you know research or anything like that. So like. I didn't realize that this, you know, was an effort. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, SIMD for free. It's just like, what? Um, but yeah, basically, you know, the compiler, the guys who write the compiler are very bright. Um, they analyze your for loops. And uh, if the for loop looks like it's doing something trivial enough that they can, you know, capture all of the side effects and, and uh, isolate it, then... Uh, then they will try to replace your code with some decode, which does the same thing, but much faster. Um, it's pretty freaking amazing. Um, in GCC 4.7, it was very, very simple. So even like you couldn't use a vector. You know, if you had a vector of floats, um, the way that like vector, you know, when you actually do the, um, the bracket on an STL vector, it passes it through this inline function. And most of the time it does nothing, but if you're in debug mode, it'll like check or do a couple other things. And just the fact that that function was in the way caused like all STL vectors to not be supported. And you, act you actually had to like create a pointer of the vector and just like, you know, so you basically have to do it yourself. But, um, but since then it's come a long way and uh, now, even if like you know, you add two vectors of floats in C plus plus, it'll it'll vectorize it um, if it can make some guarantees about the size and things like that, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it's also coming to Java. Um, it's not there yet, but uh, that's one of these kind of amazing things. Like if they build automatic vectorization into the Java virtual machine, then like. It's just going to completely change the runtime profile of, of every Java program ever. I mean, like, like who knows what's going to happen, right? Yeah, I guess it depends on how they support it. I, I don't know the, fam the exact specifics, but yeah. Um, the other yeah. thing, like we were saying, is so like if your library like Unity or whatever supports it, you get it. Um, also, there are, of course, libraries, and I didn't write any down here because I'm not up to date on these right now, but where you could get a package of, like, here's common operations you'd want to do. 
uh, and here they are implemented in ways that are very uh, amenable to GCC doing auto vectorization or ah, already have cool. SIMD instructions themselves, right? So you may right, have right. like a, a, a wrapper that you pass in STL, like for instance, like Jason was saying, the STL vectors in C++ didn't work well. But you could have someone else, well, probably, and you can find it because I've seen these before, have written code that says like, you know, here's how to do four by four matrix multiply in SIMD that takes in the vector, the STL vector, and outputs STL vector, right? And then, yeah, well, exactly. S- it wouldn't be vector, it'd be the matrix. But, um, you know, takes in right, a matrix right. and outputs a matrix. Uh, and then it handles the exact massaging into the right form and, and back out. And that's the only thing it gets you right. And that, that, those are, you know, obviously very useful because it saves you a lot of time. Yeah, one thing that I realized, I just searched on, on uh, our programming throwdown sort of agendas of all time. Uh, we've never talked about blahs. Uh, do you uh, want to talk about blahs? I think we should save it for a tool of the <laughs> You can okay. Give All right. High we'll level sum- why don't you give the high level summary and then we'll save it. For so you. I don't know too much about it. Oh, okay. But this is why basically, you're telling me to do it. so BLAS stands for Basic Linear Algebra System, and the idea is, you know, if you want to like add two matrices or invert a matrix or do kind of these kind of mathematical operations that you do in like MATLAB or one of these other tools, but you know you're not using MATLAB, you're using you know Python or C plus plus or something. There's uh, this library, this set of libraries that are Blaz libraries. And basically, it's what Patrick is saying. These guys have just killed themselves making, like, the most epic matrix inversion code ever. The most epic, you know, add two vectors together code ever. And uh, you can just use the Blaz library whenever you want to do one of those things. Yep. So and they do some pretty right? clever stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And there's some pretty clever okay. stuff about how to determine, like, because there's no one right optimal way to do something. It's going to vary by your yeah. L1 and L2 cache size, by your number of hyper-threaded cores, and by the number of your processor clock speed, and, like, every variable yeah. of your computer system. And so I made the mistake one time of uh, compiling Atlas, which is a Blas implementation. Um, I didn't want to use the one that was like built into Ubuntu and I was like, oh, I'll just build my own. And uh, it took something like eight hours to build. And basically it's like, you know, trying it's every it tries possible, every permutation. you know, yeah, yeah. It's like trying every possible way to build this library just to give you an extra 1%. I've never looked. Because, so you know, do, I don't know. Well, we can talk about it later. I don't know if they do something intelligent like gradient descent or something, or if they just straight out like try every permutation. Yeah, I don't know if they do like something intelligent or if it's just a, yeah, like you said, it's a raw parameter suite. Um, but but uh, okay, but yeah, it takes a really 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 long time, and uh, you know most most OSs will have it built in. And it'll be Linux you know that. ninety something percent. I'm making up a percentage, as as fast as it can be. But if you compile it yourself, they do some really clever things to make it as fast as can be. Yeah, that's right. Like the one you get from Ubuntu isn't made for your machine. It's made for, you know, someone's machine who's building the Ubuntu distribution. Um, and so, yeah, Patrick's right. Like if you build it from scratch after the eight hours, you will have something that is like 1% faster. Uh, but or more, matter. maybe. Yep. Yeah. So everything's on the um, web now and everybody's trying to do graphics on the web. So, of course, SIMD is coming to the web. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty wild, right? I mean... Um, so if you're going to do gaming, like I said, this is all about like doing graphics processing, audio processing, video processing, all things that have a very legitimate reason these days to be done in a web browser. Um, and if you're going to do that, you're going to want to take advantage of SIMD because it does give like... you know, It's very conceivable to have like an 8x, 10x improvement by yep. implementing this stuff. And that's, that's big. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean... Uh, me and some buddies wrote an emulator um, in effectively JavaScript. Uh, we wrote it in Dart. Actually, we talked about it on one of our shows. And uh, the emulator, you know, like rendering all the pixels actually only takes like 1% or 2% of the time. But just executing the Nintendo CPU, which is just, you know, like a 1 megahertz CPU or something ridiculous, takes like over 90% of the time. And it's because... A lot of times you're just you're doing simple operations, but on the web they're just so painfully slow, and uh, 
And so this SIMD is, is part of a bigger effort to sort of fix that problem. Yep, so this is uh, SIMD is going to be added to Dart, or so it said a year ago. So I assume it's already there. Um, so oh, oh, man, you're right. This is a year old. I didn't even notice. <laughs> so so uh, you're, you're starting to see a lot of these things. And again, um, you will continue as more and more people do stuff in the browser. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think that... Uh, um, it's only a matter of time before we get like we already have Enscripten and some of these technologies for taking you know like desktop applications and and basically compiling them for the web and it just kind of magically works, but it's still like very early stages, um, and so this is like sort of building more of that scaffolding so that we can one day get to a place where you could just build something for your desktop and the web and it would just kind of magically do what you want. Well, I think that's a wrap. Yeah, cool. Um, thanks everyone for the for following us on the stream and uh, and uh, you know we got some good feedback there. Um, pretty cool. It's been a while since we did a show, but as you can expect, with the uh, vacation, I was on vacation. Patrick's on vacation. Thanksgiving's coming up, so yeah. it's that time of year where. Uh, it's uh, hard to find time. To, yeah, we'll to try to do one before recording. Christmas, but it may end up being January. Yeah, it's possible, but uh, we we should be able to. Uh, We've got time to got time. Uh, grab some time. I think we I think we can pull it off. But if not, uh, you're we'll optimist. see you guys in January. But uh, <laughs> but anyways, it's uh, always fun to do the show, and uh, uh, you know I'm trying to think. Do we have anything news worthy like Meta? Anything I didn't meta look to up talk about? Like how many reviews we have or anything? So. Yeah, I don't think we have much meta to say. Um, this is a pretty cool one. I definitely want to cover Rust, um, that programming language. We got some other requests for languages, so we'll, we'll be uh, covering that. We get a lot of, actually, the majority of our feedback is still on Google+, Plus, um, which is awesome. I mean, we have the Facebook and the Twitter. A couple of people asked for those. But uh, but still, you know, the majority of, of, of the content is happening on the G+, Plus page. So definitely check that out. Um, and send us email. You know, we, we read all of them. Sometimes we read them on the show. Sometimes we <laughs> say your full name and embarrass you. Um, and uh, I don't think we've ever read anybody's name who told us not to. But no, I, I'm totally kidding. Yes, I mean, if you uh, if you if want you to tell remain us, anonymous, like, anonymous, anonymous, we will do that. Yeah, if you want to remain anonymous with your anonym anonymity, a- keep your anonymity intact. All right, it's late, oh, so we're gonna one. call it a wrap. <laughs> All right, see you guys later. Stop being recording. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.